everybody. It's me, Julianne Hartman, and welcome to The Journey. This is episode two of the Elizabeth Hirschberger story, which has been pretty amazing. If you did not catch the first one, you got to go back and listen, because we're going to do as many episodes as we can on her, because this is so interesting. But I need you to follow along, so make sure you start at episode one. Don't just come in on the third or fourth episode. We need you to listen because this story is really important. And again, it may not, you may not have been raised Amish or in some kind of a cult, but there might be some kind of a bondage that you lived under and you believed, and maybe you still do now, that you could still be set free from when you hear that, you know, especially the truth when her when she gave her life to Jesus and everything changed at that moment. So um, this is going to be really cool. So I hope you get your coffee ready because now we're going to go into episode two. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your heart and letting us into your life. I know things are private, but you are literally opening up a door for all of us to hear your story. And we appreciate it so much. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So we left off last week. She was just kind of laying down the foundation of what it means to be Amish. Now there was a show called Breaking Amish. <laughs> I don't even know if it's still around, but I do remember, um, I never really watched it. I think I maybe caught a few episodes, but I didn't. I was like, to me, it was just like it, they were actors and they were actors, of course, but it was more like the whole thing was scripted and that would never even happen, right? So um, so if you want to hear about that, you do have to go back to the first episode. So now we're going to move on from there. We're going to talk about, I would like to know, like, what did a daily life look like for you as a kid let's say you're 10 years old what does that daily life look like do you wake up and you have to milk the cows you know it's like what did you have to do yeah so when I actually when I was 10 we did have cows um and we actually shipped milk like we we had a farm and we milked cows and then we sold the milk and so yeah there was cows to milk lots of chores um obviously because we did everything with horse and buggy we had a lot of um a lot of horses. So we had the, the horses that we would use for the buggies. And then we had the big uh, giant horses that did all the field work. And so we had that, and then we did our own butchering and stuff. So we had lots of pigs and cows and baby calves and horses, you know, giving birth. So we had little foals to take care of. And so, so that part of it was actually fun. Like I enjoyed that part. Now, as, as girls though, we, we did help with the chores, but then we kind of went to the house and did the housework and, and the guys did all the, all the fun stuff, in my opinion. Um, so, and then we made all our own clothing, baby clothes, diapers, um, all of that was handmade. Um, so no pampers whatsoever. And again, uh, as I said on last episode is uh, just keep in mind, this is where I grew up. This is not every Amish person's story, but this is my story and, and the way I grew up, and so I'm fully aware that that other churches in the Amish have some more conveniences than what we did. But so we had no pampers, no there was no bod clothing, like right down to the last piece of underwear. Um, and you so made your own underwear, we did. We absolutely did. Wow. Now, do just a little side note. Do you still sew? Uh no. Okay, this question, can you sew? <laughs> I, can, I can sew, however, I, I could probably easier make a piece of Amish clothing than, than non-Amish because I've grown up, I grew up using those patterns and these are super hard, but also I never enjoyed sewing and I still don't. And now that I don't have to, I just don't. Now, some of my, uh, like some of my family, they still like sewing and I don't have a problem with that. Um, I just don't like it. We made all our own quilts and all of that stuff. And we had to like make all those little stitches with our hand, like with a needle and, you know, the, the simple, is that what you call them? Like on your finger? So yeah. those were just like, I still get knots in my shoulder just thinking about it. So no, I don't do any sewing or quilting. I buy everything. Um, and I'm so thankful that I can buy what I need and I don't have to make my own stuff. Um, and that is not to say that I think if you make your own clothing, you're religious. I just don't like it. Yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> um, there's so plenty of goodwills around in secondhand stores that if I can't afford to buy new, I'll go, you know, so I don't make any of my own clothing. No. All right. So 
you that would be really cool now about with like you know seeing babies you know baby whatever horses being born yeah you hear little baby animals yes and all that but um what if you so since you were kind of raised in this like for instance for me it's a little hard for me to see like bloody things (laughs) so so did I mean if you had a squeamish heart did, did it didn't matter you had to watch it anyway and be a part of it so a funny thing about that like here's another Amish tradition or religion and again I don't know how different Amish churches do it but in mine nobody talked to kids that weren't married about babies or pregnancy or anything like that even even in animals now obviously the boys since they were a little more involved in that kind of thing you know with the animals and stuff they knew a little bit about it but you know, if you saw your mama grow in a big belly, you didn't talk about it. You didn't ask questions. She didn't talk to you about, Hey, you're going to have a baby sibling, like brother or sister. And you got to celebrate with her. Like I did with my kids. Um, none of that happened. And so I remember an incident with a horse where she had a foal and they had already taken care of the foal, but I saw the, um, the placenta and I freaked out because I didn't know this stuff happened. And so I was like, oh my gosh, the horse had it, like he got gutted, and it, but it was still breathing. And the boys were like, get in the house. You know, like they didn't want to tell me what it was. Obviously they understood what it was. And I'm like 15 already, like just tell me for Pete's sake. Um, but they were just kind of like, get in the house, you know, um, which I don't blame them because that's, you know, that's just how we did things because you don't talk about birth or, babies or and the reason for it is because of how the baby gets there and that part is a dirty bad like kind of secretive thing you don't talk about it um and so when there's a baby in somebody's belly you don't talk about it um and so I was actually never really involved in the bloody part of the the cows and the horses and all of that so I don't know. I have a little bit of a squeamish heart when it comes to blood. So I don't know how I would have responded to that. I, I don't think I probably would have enjoyed it. I just liked watching them eat and feed and, you know. <laughs> okay. So a question now you talked about get, being pregnant. How many brothers and sisters did you have? Or I have you- eight brothers. I have eight brothers and three sisters. Okay. So obviously they do not practice birth control. Well, no. They don't. And I didn't either until I had four kids super close together. And I said to my husband, I don't care if it's sin, like I'm done. Like I can't have more babies right now. And so clearly in the Amish, I don't even know if they know about birth control, honestly, because I didn't until we left the Amish and joined the Mennonites where my midwife was like, um, you might want to consider something. And, but we were taught that at the time, the Mennonites, you know, that were helping us kind of taught that birth control is not right. You know, you want to just trust the Lord. And, but after I had my fourth baby and my oldest was three, I said, I don't care. I literally told my husband I'd go to hell before I had another baby because it was too much. That's, that's, and, and just FYI, I was not yet, well, I believe I wasn't, convert like a Christian yet. And so, and I I was for sure not transformed or healed from all the pain. And so I was like, I can't do this. You know, four babies, I had a three, a two, a one-year-old and a newborn. And that's too much. much. And like my body, I, I was at that point, I was about 200 pounds because, you know, you just don't have time to take care of yourself. And so I had let my body go and I was depressed all the time. And I had no knowledge of what kind of food to eat to keep your body healthy. And um, so, yeah, but I just, I had finally just had it. And I said, I don't care what happens to my soul. My body cannot have another baby. So we're going to do something about it. (laughs) So now, all right, well then what, how do they keep from having like 20, 30 kids or did they? Well, my aunt had 19 kids no twins wow 
some people had in the, actually it was very common in the Amish to have 12 to 15 to 18 kids. And that's a, that's a lot of kids. That's a lot. That's like a whole congregation. <laughs> Truly it is. Or an orphanage. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So then, well, oh my gosh. No. So, did they, did, so then they just stopped being intimate after a while and that's why, how they kept from getting pregnant? I don't know. I mean, I guess there's an age factor there where, you well, know. I think you a, should ask your, your family. At a certain age, you just, I guess, don't have any more babies. My mama had 12. Well, she originally had 13. My my brother that was born right after me, he passed away at 10 days old. Um, but yeah, my mom had 12. Um, but yeah, my aunt on my dad's side had 19 kids. And to my knowledge, there was no twins. That's incredible. All right. So you were at home during the day. Now, obviously you were homeschooled, correct? Well, actually, no, we didn't, we didn't homeschool, but we didn't go to public school. I went to a little one room schoolhouse uh, where we went from grade one to grade eight. Um, and we just did the basic subjects. We did reading, writing, spelling, arithmetic, and English, and that's it. So we didn't do any, um, like history, science, and all of the extracurricular stuff. And even in the in the math that we did, um, we skipped all of the, like the stocks and the bonds and stuff like that because we'll never need it, you know? Um, and then we only went to eighth grade, which has been kind of challenging for me, you know, because when you want to leave and live life outside of the Amish, that really stinks. Um, yeah, and, see that. So yeah. for myself, it wasn't like I was going to go back into high school or, or education because by now I have four kids and I'm a mama. And so my source of education continued with just me, you know, reading and studying on my own, but there was no degree that came. Um, but I mean, there's always, we have so much at our fingertips that we can always continue our education. Um, but as far as, you know, when I went to Bible college, they wanted to know my, they wanted to see my diploma and I, I wasn't able to show it to them. And so right. the Lord, they were very gracious. Um, and they allowed us to come, come anyway. And at that time they were accredited. So I actually got a diploma from them. Um, so yeah, that's Karis Bible college, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, but it was really, really to me, it was not even just hard. It was embarrassing. Like it was just that, you know, you've only, and you, you'd hear comments. Um, you never went beyond the eighth grade. And I know it's just out of curiosity, but to me, it was always a source of kind of intimidation. Um, and I've grown out of that. I've learned to just, you know what, I know who I am in Christ and that's all that matters. But at the time I was extremely insecure in who I was. And so that was kind of, really challenging for me to hear questions like that and to be on and to answer them honestly <laughs> well and, and you're right it, it is just we're just curious because it's so foreign you yeah. know to to what we know okay so what now let's get to your home life uh with you know the dynamics of your actual family did you get along I mean y'all get along well did you have you know a, a father that you know wasn't you know father of the year did you like and not to disparage your family at all but just like what happened within the family because a lot of times when I've, I've done a few of these interviews before and um and you hear that you know they were one way you know at church and then at home they did not follow any of the rules but they were very you know yeah. just abusive and all that so what was your experience like so that was that was a lot of that was actually quite a bit the way my father was he looked right in the church and actually most of the Amish church really respected him especially those who didn't really now my father-in-law did not respect him and he did not like when my husband started seeing me and I think a lot of it was because of my dad um, but apparently I guess he knew my father more than but in in the church the congregation that we were going to whenever they needed uh, help with dealing with the public like anything that had anything to do with the court or, or a lawyer or anything like that, 
um, they always came to my dad because I guess he just had that kind of influence and he was really good with his, you know, words. Like he, he just, he had influence. Um, but in the home, so it was super weird because he had kind of, I mean, him and the boys had a decent relationship. And now, I mean, there were outbursts of anger and just, you know, stuff like that, that, you know, would they would have a big fight, but then, you know, it would be over. For, for me, it was different. For us girls, it was different. Now, was he just super mean and like come at us with like hate and anger and force? No, he came with a smile and tenderness and, and, uh, super kind. And that was the one time that he was super kind because a lot of times he was a harsh dad or he, he'd lose his temper and, and, you know, it was kind of scary. Um, but whenever he wanted what he wanted, he was super kind, super gentle. He was a groomer. He just, you know, he knew how to get what he wanted. And so for me, it started with, um, Obviously, I knew my dad as kind of, I just wanted to stay away from him. But then the sexual abuse started when I was super young. And it started by, it's time I start with you. And I thought, oh, what? You know? And anyways, he's like telling me all the things that he has to do because of, you know, this is his job as a dad. Um, and this is what he's going to have to do. And I could tell you the reasons why, but I don't want to gross your audience out. So I'm going to leave that part out. But there were reasons for personal development of myself that he told me he would have to do that or I wouldn't develop as a woman. Um, oh, my gosh. Wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, so... I have so many questions are flying now. What, where do you fall in the girls? Are you older? Are you the middle or the youngest? I'm uh, number three. I'm the third girl, but I'm okay. number eight in, in all of the kids. In all of them. So did, did your other. And a younger sister. Okay. So did your older sisters, um, did you watch them go through this first or was that always very hidden? It's very discreet about it. And the thing is, we never talked about it until we were all kind of past it. Um, okay. And I'm oh. getting, getting to that part. Um, okay. Okay. I don't want to rush you. Keep going. No, you're fine. Um, and so when he told me that about the whole, you know, womanhood, I thought, well, I definitely want to be a full woman. So, you know, and, and first off, I'm seven years old. I believe I was seven, seven or eight. Oh, so my God. And so why wouldn't I believe him? He's dad and he's for one super gentle. And so I'm, I'm liking this new like love that I'm getting from him. So you weren't getting that kind of gentleness in any other way, except for when he would come to you on a sexual. So, now, I want to, I want to say too, that it's not like he was always harsh or always yelling or always, it just that when he, he just wasn't really paying attention to you which is actually quite traditional for Amish people but like when he wanted to have his little session he got super attentive and like he talked to you and and it was new to me so so it's not like he was every day like physically abusing me I mean he might yell at me or or like I just I just don't remember feeling that active love coming from him unless it was uh that part and right. so, so it this continued like on a pretty much a daily basis. And here's what often confused me when I got older was he would always promise he'd never do it again. Um, and so that always confused me. I'm like, wait, I thought you were supposed to do this, but you're promising me you wouldn't, but then he did. And so personally, I really, from the bottom of my heart, believe he didn't want to do it, but he just had no control over it. He could not stop. It was an addiction that he didn't want to do, but he couldn't stop. I don't know, but why else would he promise me he'd never do it again? But anyway, so, but I do remember the first time 
And I remember this like it was yesterday, the first time he took me aside and he molested me. It was so confusing because he said, he has to do this as a father. And I knew this wasn't gonna be the last time. I knew this was now a new normal. Um, but I remember when I walked away, I went outside and I remember exactly where I went and I started crying and I said, my life is ruined forever. And I'm, and I'm just, I'm amazed that even at that young age, something flipped inside of me, innocence was gone. And it just showed me that God created us in such an innocent way that when somebody comes in in such a perverted way, and takes that it doesn't matter how young you are something breaks inside of you and you know that you're you're no longer something flipped and I just remember thinking and I remember sitting down and I just went my life is ruined forever because I knew this wasn't a one-time thing I knew this was something that that I would have to deal with and um well I'm so sorry Julianne I'm sorry I don't mean to make you cry if uh -huh. No, it's just the, you said that like you knew that, you know, your life was never going to be the same at that age. My God. So, and I, I, was so sad. I used to cry when I tell people my story. Sorry <laughs> that I'm doing this to you. Even just when I, I got through it. Wow. I, I really can look back and I can, I can truly say, yeah, it makes me sad for the little me. Um, but I'm just, Compared to what Jesus did for me, compared to the life I'm living now, I I can look back and I can say truly say that that's in my past and I'm living a healthy and whole life in Christ. And so I do want to let people know that I'm not. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I wait. So hold on, said I got questions. Go ahead, ask ask away. It's totally fine. Oh. Okay, so like no one else was around, nobody saw it, no one, what did your mom think? Did your mom know it? Like how? No, she did not know. So she never knew with any of the girls? No, I, I don't, I don't think so. So this wasn't like an Amish tradition, this was your dad? No, this was certainly not, no way. I, I. So it's not like your mom knew it because this is what you do as an Amish no. tradition. No, Amish, this was definitely the exception. Now, I will say it does happen a good bit in the Amish, and here's why. Because they don't take something like this. Even the preachers, when they found out after the fact, when my my sister's husband, when she got married and he found out, he went to the preachers, um, and he talked to them, and they, oh, they did something about it, but they don't go to the law with something. You know what they do? They excommunicate him for a certain amount of time, but with absolutely zero supervision to make sure he's not doing it. So while he's excommunicated for his crime with my sister, he's doing it with me. Oh, God. So there's no, so they don't go to the law um, and they, they just punish him in their own way, but there's no, I could understand if they want to do it that way, but then they should have somebody watching him, making sure he's not doing it again. Um, so they, did your mom find out at that point? So she knew that there was something that he did with my sister, but she thought it was a one-time thing and he repented and he's moved on. Now, the way he, the way he would do it with me oftentimes was he's working out in the barn or in the shop or something and he needs help, right? Can you come help me? I mean, my mom, who's my grandpa wouldn't have hurt a fly. And so I think my mom just had a lot of trust of course. and she didn't really ask questions. And so a lot of times it happened like that, or my mom is gone working in the garden or, or away, like going to town or going wherever she went. And a lot of times we would stay home and um, and he would do it then. So I feel like he he was really good too at hiding it from her. A lot of times it was in the morning, mom's up making breakfast, dad is still in bed. And then, you know, the kids get up and, you know, he'd call your name, whatever. It, he did it all kinds of different ways. Um, and I don't mean to be too graphic, but um, 
those were some of my morning routines um, where he would still be in bed. My mom's in the kitchen making breakfast and the living room is separate. You know, there's a partition between the living room and the kitchen. And so, and and then there's the bedroom off the living room on, in the other corner. And so he got away with it super easy. I didn't, however, because I got in trouble for not getting in the kitchen and helping my mom. Um, but anyway, so the hard part for me was this was right. This was his job. Um, and he had specific reasons that he needs to do it for me. Right. Okay, and so just, I mean, to help me with this. So he was saying to you, like, in order for you to become a full woman, there are things that the dad has to do to the daughter to make that happen. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you think that this is how, like, if there was a God or whatever, <laughs> that you'd be like, wow, this is, in, this is hard. What God has yeah. And so, so uh, I don't know how much I should share. Um, <laughs> well, okay. So I always had questions because I'll say it like this. The better you like it, the better your results are. Right. Okay. And I was both not liking and I wasn't seeing results that I thought I should because, you know, I had seen some of my friends developing a lot more quickly than I was. And so I thought, well, he's probably right. You know, the more you like it, the more. Oh, oh God. What a and so, so here's what I did. Here's what I did. And I, and this is one prayer that I'm so thankful the Lord didn't answer, but I would go to my secret place and I had this one spot that I would go and I would literally beg God to help me like what he, and I'm, I'm, begging God on my knees, begging God. Um, because I absolutely despised what he did. And I was becoming extremely um, bitter towards my dad for, and for what I thought was no reason. I couldn't stand the feeling that I was having towards him because I thought it was coming from my heart of just, I was just that bad of a person. And I would, beg God to help me like what he's doing and help me like him because I would see the relationship my best friend had with her dad and she later became my sister-in-law and and I just saw the the relationship she had with her dad and I was like man I want that but I never could um and God never answered my prayer for years I prayed and he never answered my prayer and so I just became convinced that one, I'm a bad person because I don't like my dad and I don't like what he's doing. And well, this is my punishment because, um, and then two, that I'm too far gone for God to answer my prayers because he's like, why would he answer my prayers? And so I, I turn 18. Now I will say he did, he quit completely with the physical stuff when I turned 18. Um, I mean, he would still talk dirty and whatever, but physically when I turned 18, that was the end. Um, but from seven to 18, so 11 years? I say seven. I'm not quite sure exactly how old I was, but it was somewhere in there. Um, well, even if it was a month, <laughs> it was too much. Yeah, I don't, I, but yeah, it was somewhere, somewhere in that um, age range. Um, I just say seven because I know what grade I was in and that's, you know, um, well, so we're out of time again. Oh, no. already. I can't okay. believe it. Oh my gosh. This has been crazy. I mean, I honestly just you, the way you painted that picture that like I went there in my, in my mind and it just really just, wow, made me so sad. And just imagine like, you're just one of many, you know, and it's like, and some maybe never get out of it. And then we wonder why people are sick, you know, and we wonder why people are depressed and want to kill themselves. And, you know, why, why women are, you know, become obese. Like there's so many things that this kind of lifestyle brings on. And then, you know, then we blame, we blame God for it. And it's just awful. The I mentioned earlier. Maybe that was before we went live. I I, remember I mentioned that there's a hole in people. Yes. 
Yeah. So but there's so many, there's so many things and we don't even know, but if you want to find out more about Elizabeth's story, you got to come back next week. <laughs> so thank you guys for watching. This has just been probably one of the most emotional journeys that I've ever done before. So uh, just stay tuned with us. It's going to be, I'm sure that what, what the great thing is, is that there is a silver lining here. <laughs> there is, we're there getting towards the victory. There's a yes. miracle. And we are. And yes. that's what's awesome. So thank you guys for watching. Please go to healingjourneystoday.com so you can be a part of our whole, you know, just our whole infrastructure of what we do here. Uh, you can get on our newsletter. You find out things that we're doing. We're always doing so many amazing things with this platform. And so you all are being a part of it. So I thank you so much. And we will see you next week on the journey. Bye-bye.